Yes? Who is it? Telegram. A telegram for me? Oh, my goodness. Who can it be from? Just a moment. Where's the telegram? Wait a minute. You're not a telegram boy. You... No, no, no. Stay outside. You, you have no right to come in here. <laughs> Theater 5 presents The Group. I do for you, Lieutenant. You are aware, Doctor, of the murder that took place in this apartment building last night? Mm. Old Mrs. Krasner on the 10th floor, beaten to death. Yes, most unfortunate. Unfortunate? <laughs> it's a strange way to react after a woman is beaten almost beyond recognition. It was obviously the work of a very disturbed man. Yes, well, what about poor old Mrs. Krasner? I imagine she's quite disturbed about the whole thing. Well, the woman is dead. What more can one say? It is a most unfortunate situation. Well, one can try to catch the poor, disturbed man responsible. Yes, I agree with you. Society must be protected at any cost. And you come to me because you think one of my patients is responsible. I know one of your patients is responsible. This is most interesting. I see my patients once, twice a week. I am a medical man with 20 years' experience... And I know no such thing. You do treat emotionally disturbed people. Yes, but no one so divorced from reality. If I knew such a patient was potentially violent, I would have him committed at once. You can predict a murder before it happens? Not a murder. But you can usually tell when a psychopathic personality has become so removed from reality that it is dangerous to let him run around loose. A danger both to himself and to others. You said usually. Yes, in most cases. Yes, but you can't predict this 100% of the time. Nobody can predict it 100% of the time. We are not clairvoyant. So in this case, you could be treating a psychopathic killer and not know it. Yes, it is possible, but not very probable. Dr. Karens, on Thursday nights, which patients do you see? You mean the night of the murder? Yes. If you mean their names, I'm afraid I cannot tell you that. That's a professional confidence. No, no, I mean, what kind of patients do you see? Thursday nights, privately, I see only two manic depressives. But they are not at all the type that would do violence to someone else. They would destroy themselves before they destroyed someone else. And that's all? And let me see. Oh, yes, the group meets Thursday nights. The group? Yes, a psychotherapy group. That is where emotionally disturbed people sit around together and by a mutual exchange of views, they vent a lot of their hostilities, gain insights into themselves and others, and learn to relate to other people. Mm -hmm. For some types of neurosis, it is a most successful form of therapy. For some types? Yes. For convenience in the profession, we divide our neurotics into two groups, the healthy and the unhealthy. The unhealthy neurotic cannot uh, function, even to the point where he can't make himself get up to go to work in the morning. The healthy neurotic gets up and goes to work, but he gets himself into trouble after he gets there. Usually, the people in group therapy are what we call good, healthy neurotics. No chance of a good uh, pathological killer being there? Hardly. Well, if there were... One of the functions of the group would uh, be to get him to confess. Not get him to confess, but to let him confess, if it would make him feel better. And then you'd turn him over to me? No. I would have him committed for his own safety and for that of society. But, Doctor, the law says... The law says I must not betray my patient's confidences under any circumstances. If I did, I would lose their trust and I would not be able to help any of them. But... Uh, Fortunately, the question is academic, since no such patient exists in my group. Yes, but if he were in your group, he'd be exceedingly hard to detect, wouldn't he? 
I understand uh, psychotics are extremely clever liars. Mm, yes. Exceedingly hard to detect. Yes, well, I have reason to believe, Doctor, that Mrs. Krasner's killer is in that group. How can you say that? Well, I have inside information. Inside information? Yes, one of your patients in that group is a police detective. I have no policeman listed in my files. He lied about his past history when he came to you because he was afraid we'd find out about it at headquarters and it would hurt his chances for promotion. So, why does he tell you this now? Because his conscience bothers him. He says he believes he knows who the killer is in the group. And he feels it's his duty as a policeman to turn him in if he confesses. As a psychiatrist, I will try to dissuade him from any such action. As a policeman, he has a duty to perform. He'll not be kept from doing his duty by an oath of professional confidence. What is the name of this detective? Well, I'm sorry, Doctor. We cops have our own professional confidences. You know, Lieutenant, if this psychotic is as clever a liar as we believe he is, he could even turn out to be your own policeman. Yes. And using that same rule of thumb, he could even be you. Or you, by the same token. In this society of liars, whom does one trust? <laughs> and so we have problems tonight, yes? Uh, well, now, this may not sound like much of a problem to you, but I haven't been able to sleep or eat for the last three days just thinking about it. You see, this cat my parents had for 14 years died. Cat! Huh? Cat! Let's talk about a real problem for a change. Like the inadequacy of these stupid American males. I think Myra is right. The greatest problem facing the nation today is relatedness. Nobody knows how to relate anymore. Oh, I, I know how to relate. To a cat? Cats, men, sex. We talk about such trivial problems all the time. A woman was murdered in this building last Thursday and nobody knows, nobody cares. I think everybody knows that, but nobody cares. I don't care, <laughs> but what are you going to do? Some coop nuts saw some old woman happens all the time. Honestly, it's not safe to walk the streets anymore. And it's going to be that way as long as nobody does anything about it. I believe the subject under discussion was David's cat. Its death has caused him some discomfort. Yeah, uh, you see, we had this cat for 14 years. I mean, it was like a part of the family. I grew up with it. Doctor, I... doctor, do you consider the death of a cat to be of equal importance as that of a woman? Me? No. But since David raised the question, and we can discuss only one subject at a time... You're not afraid to talk about the death of the old woman in this building, are you, doctor? No. But I think it is up to the group to decide what we will talk about here. How does the group feel? Doesn't matter to me what we talk about. No, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. All right, then. Last week, an old woman was beaten to death in this building. What aspect of this would we like to discuss? Nobody has anything to say? Stephen, why pick on me? I'm not picking on you, but... Since you insisted we talk about this subject, I thought you might have something you wanted to say. Suppose I said somebody here committed that murder. Well, that's impossible. I don't believe it's it. It's not only possible, it happened. Those are very grave charges. They're true. Somebody here murdered her? Yes. Oh. I don't think it's up to me to say. I think it's up to the person to confess. No one here wants to confess to the murder of the old woman on the 10th floor? No? Good. Then let us go on to more profitable subjects. Uh, David, you were talking about your cat. Why are uh, you protecting him, doctor? Protecting whom? You know who I mean. Surely you don't mean David, not good, sweet, quiet little David. Who else left the alternate session after last Thursday's meeting beside David? Why, well, just David. And you? I followed him. Well, you, you followed yeah, me? Yeah, you weren't clever enough to think that somebody might be following you, were you? Well, no. Well, well, the rest were sitting in a restaurant having coffee. You thought you'd slip back to the doctor's office unnoticed. Yeah. yeah. You came yeah. back, and the door was locked, and you just stood there trying to make up your mind what to do. Well, yes. Because yes, you I... didn't have the courage to knock on the doctor's door, you started climbing the stairs. Oh, no. You no. went all the way up to the 10th floor... Before you found a landing that felt right. No, no, And no. for no reason at all, you walked 
out into the 10th floor corridor and stopped in front of Mrs. Kastner's door. No. There was no logic to what you did. You had stood there for a full 20 minutes before you got up enough courage to push the buzzer. And when Mrs. Krasner asked you who it was, you said you had a telegram for her. No. When she opened the door, you forced her back into the room. No, no. She no. started to scream. You began beating her. No, no. Because no. she was old and hideous and reminded you of somebody else, somebody you hated. You beat her to release the pressure building up in your chest. No, no, no. Why are you lying? I was there. I saw you. No, I died. You'll never get away with it, David. I was a witness. All right, all right. I... I... I, I killed her. Now leave me alone. <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> question now is, who's going to turn him in? I suspected him all along. I always felt there was a lot he was never telling us. Remember all those groups where he never said anything? He was always so, so quiet yeah. and meek. The quiet ones you have to watch. When they go berserk, they leave them looking like hamburgers. I, I, I didn't mean to do it. I, I, I didn't mean to do it. David, not cry. I, 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 I didn't mean to do it. David, crying isn't going to do any good. Try to listen to me. I, I, I didn't want to do it. David... Isn't it possible that you didn't do it? What? What? Isn't it possible that you only imagine that you did it? You feel so guilty over so many things. You you feel you must be guilty of this crime, too. Uh, no. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Why are you trying to protect him? I'm not trying to protect him. Oh, yes, you are. Every time something happens, you rush to David's defense. Oh, I've noticed that. I am not trying to protect or to defend David. I know his case history much better than all of you. David is one of the world's victims. He feels so guilty over the things he imagines he is capable of doing that he will accept the guilt for anything, even crimes he has not committed. Well, we just heard him confess. But this sort of thing happens every day at the police station. You read about it all the time in the newspapers. A, a crime is committed, and three people call up to say they are responsible. The police have to be very careful to separate the real guilty from the imagined guilty. Isn't that so, Stephen? Why do you ask me? I don't know anything about the operation of police stations. Don't you? No, I don't. See, you're doing it again. Doing what? Ganging up on me, accusing me of all sorts of things, of being a policeman, for one thing. Aren't you? No. You seem very anxious to have this man punished. I don't want to punish him. You suggested we turn him into the police. I just want to segregate him from society to protect ourselves, that's all. Don't you want that, or do you just want to let him run around loose? We have yet to establish that he has committed the crime. He just confessed to it. What more do you want? Yes, we all heard him. Did you kill this woman, David? Uh, uh... No. Now, now you got him changing his story. No, I'm not. Did you or did you not leave the alternate session early? Y yes, yes, I did. And did you or did you not return here? I, I, I did. You wanted to see me? Yes. But you lost the courage to ask for me? Yes. So you turned around and went away? You're putting words in his mouth. That's true, Doctor. You are. You two aren't in this together. Yeah, are. that's what I'm beginning to think. I think the doctor wanted the old woman killed and he put David up to it. Is that what the rest of you think? I, I don't know what to think anymore. Before we jump to any more conclusions, let us ask ourselves a few questions. One, if David were the murderer, what good would it do to turn him over into the police? Well, he's good to be turned over to the police. Why? To protect society from him. Suppose I had him committed to an institution. Again, I'm assuming David is the murderer, which I don't believe he is. Wouldn't that serve the same purpose? No, not at all. Why? Because after a few years, they'd let him out. Not until he was cured. You have no guarantee that he would be cured. Yeah, a lot of times they parole murderers and they go out and kill somebody again. Only because they're not cured. You're missing the point of the whole thing. The penalty for death in this state is death. A murderer deserves to die in the electric chair. Then you would cure him by killing him? It isn't a question of curing him. It's a question of getting rid of him for the good of society. And uh, if I were, as you suggest, 
am accomplice in this crime, what would be my penalty? Ten to fifteen as an accessory before and after the fact. Mm. Which brings us to the second and last question. Who was the person who witnessed this crime? Who could have done something to prevent it and who did nothing? Hey, that's right. Why didn't I think of that? What is your penalty for being an accessory before and after the fact, Stephen? Yes. Why didn't you stop him? I'm not an accessory. You could have stopped him. Yeah, why didn't you? It was none of my business. You're making it your business to see that David is punished. I'm not making it my business. You should have stopped him to protect the old woman. I couldn't have stopped him. He was a maniac. He would have completely overpowered me. You don't know their strength when they go out of their minds like that. No. The reason you didn't stop David was because he was not there. That's right. He wasn't there. Who was there, Steve? I... I, uh... I don't want to say. Why not? Well, uh, because nobody, nobody will believe me if I tell them. Go ahead, say it. But I, I didn't want to say because nobody would believe me. It, and, and it would destroy the group's confidence in you. In me? Yeah. You were the one. You were there. I didn't want to say before. No, I am the maniac? I was trying to protect you, doctor. Protect me? Yeah, I figured nobody would believe me if I told him it was you. Now who's lying? You are, Doctor. Isn't it true that nobody from this group was there except you? No. That you were the one who climbed the stairs, who stood outside the door with your heart pounding, waiting to ring the bell? No. The pressure was building up in you. It had been building up for weeks. You had not been able to sleep or eat. No. You think you can fool me, Stephen? I've been observing you in this group for weeks. You might have been able to fool me about what you do for a living, but not about your emotional history. What makes you tick? No. When Mrs. Krasner opened the door, she was the one you were looking for. The perfect target for your anger. An old woman. Like the old woman who raised you as a child. No. Who humiliated you as a child. Who told you you were a bad boy. Who punished you for being bad. No. The pressure built up when you saw her, so you had to kill her. The way you wanted to kill her when you were little. No. So you struck out at her the way a child would strike out. Only now, you are a man. And being a man, your child's blows killed her. No! You have killed before, haven't you, Stephen? No, no, no! Why don't you tell the truth for a change, Stephen? You'll feel so much better. All right, all right. I did kill her. And now live to kill again. He's got a gun! You think you're so smug and smart, sitting back there and solving all the problems? Well, look into the muzzle of this. Look death in the face and try to be smart, doctor. Give me the gun, Stephen. No. You're going to die, Doctor, and all your psychology can't save you. You don't want to kill me, Stephen. Give me the gun. No, no, I want to see you grovel the way I had to grovel. Nobody wants anybody to grovel, Stephen, the least of all me. Let me have the gun, Stephen. I want to help you. No, nobody helps anybody in this world. It's kill or be killed. That's the only way you can keep people in line. You don't want to kill me, Stephen. Only the little boy in you wants to kill and be punished. I don't want to punish you, Stephen. I want to help you. Let me have the gun so I can help you. I can't do that, Doctor. If I do, you'll turn me in. No, I won't. I promise. You don't want to kill me any more than you wanted to kill her. No. And you didn't want to kill her either, No. You? you only think you have to kill her, don't you? I, I, I don't know. You've killed her many times, haven't you, Stephen? Yes. And now you're tired of killing her, aren't you? Yes. Give me the gun. I want to help you. I never... I never wanted to kill her, Doctor. I know. She was so, so much bigger than I, and she used to hit me. I know. I loved her, and she used to hit me. So I had to kill her. I didn't want to kill her, but she didn't love me. Grandma, Grandma, please don't hit me anymore. There, Stephen, don't cry. I love you. That's right, Stephen. But... Doctor. Let me have the gun. I love you, Grandma. I love you. But he ought to be put away. No. But he is a monster. A monster? Yes. A monster suffering. But still a human being. We must destroy the monster and save the human being. <laughs> Theater 
Spies has presented The Group, written by George Bamber and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Guy Sorrell, Bill Griffiths, Elspeth Eric, William Redfield, Rhino Rayburn, and Harry Belliver. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Original music by Alexander Vlas Dutsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. Thank you.